Hey, this is uh, CRDTs for non-academics. More specifically, it's geared towards engineers. So most of the time when you ask people what CRDTs are, what a conflict-free replicated data types means, you get a kind of a blank stare. Reason is they're mostly tracked in academic papers. So this is an attempt to unshackle them. So CRDTs have a, a really magical quality in that the actors are autonomous, but they're still consistent. And this is like as magical as if a Pegasus and Gandalf had a baby. It's a very large promise. And it, it, it you know, delivers on this promise by bending the rules a little bit. So this isn't an ACID database. It's something called strong eventual consistency. And you know, at any given point in time, there's no guarantee that everyone will have the same data, but they're going to converge to the same data, and they're not going to lose any data during this convergence. And the way they do this is by using commutative operations for replication. And commutative operations are cool because you're not too worried about order of replication. Uh, here are some examples in math. You don't worry about who comes first, except for in division, which is not commutative. And once you have this very unique property, your race conditions in a distributed environment are just completely different. So this type of replication is really useful the more distributed you get, or the more asynchronous you get. And there are a lot of use cases and architectures where CRDTs are helpful. So let's do some examples, right? Let's have three actors. Everybody starts with the value x equals 2, and each of these actors is going to autonomously increment x. So we got three actors, everyone has x equals two. Blue guy adds one, purple guy adds two, orange guy adds three. Now the, these, rep, these modifications are replicated and it doesn't matter in which order. We could have done three first or two first, it doesn't really matter. At the end, when we start with x equals two and we add one, two, three in any order, it could be three, two, one, we arrive at x equals eight. And this is an example of commutative replication. Now I'm gonna make a bold assertion. Commutative replication can work for all of JSON. That means for numbers, strings, objects, and arrays. And this includes nested JSON. And another assertion is that you can, once you have the base operations of set, delete, increment, and insert, you can build higher level operations on all of JSON. So basically these four data fields on the left side and these four operations on the right cover all of JSON. And we've talked about commutative operations, which cover increment, insert, and delete. Now we're gonna talk about set, which is convergent. And by convergent, I mean, in a distributed environment, all the actors are gonna eventually arrive at the same state, but during the time of convergence, they may have differing values. So we use last writer wins to determine convergence. And we're gonna go, we're gonna use an example of three gurus sitting on mountains. And you ask them all, what is the meaning of life? The first guy says family at time one. The second guy says freedom at time two. And the last guy says 42 at time three. Following last writer wins, the last guy to holler an answer, 42, is the winner. But it plays out a little differently when we start to think about the followers of the gurus. So we got mommy, daddy, and baby. And when these gurus spout their answers... They arrive at mommy, daddy, and baby in different orders just due to the distance between all the players in this picture. So daddy gets 42 family freedom, mama gets family freedom 42, and baby gets freedom family 42 in that order. And they're all going to converge to 42. That's going to be the last writer wins. But if we take mommy as an example, she first saw family, then she saw freedom, then she saw 42. Whereas father just saw 42 and ignored the rest. So during the time of convergence, they had different values. And that's something you have to keep in mind with sets. And it's a difference between a distributed set and a centralized set, like what you're used to in a relational database. So in this distributed world, using set, I recommend use it for constants or things that are close to constants. Like if you reset something every hour, that's, that's basically a constant because it has no chance of concurrency. And there are actually a ton of use cases that have no chance of concurrency. It's just that the use case itself prohibits concurrency or just is never concurrent. So they also work for that, but you have to examine the use cases. Okay, 
Now we're going to go through those four operations on a bunch of different data types and it gets dry and then in the end it gets wet but it, it's pretty long. And here's the table of operations. Like we're going to do seven different data examples and then at the end we're going to go into causal consistency. So in this example we're going to decrement the counter that we were incrementing before. We start with x equals 8 and the, the trick to decrementing and increment at the same time is you just have two different counters, one for increments and one for decrements. So on to the concurrent decrement. Everyone starts with x equals 8, which is represented plus 8 minus 0. And they subtract 4, 5, and 6 respectively, which is replicated. In the end, plus 8 minus 15 at all actors evaluates to minus 7. So here we're in a set example, the convergent set. I'm going to use last writer wins like the guru example, but you know, in the same format. So there's a plus seven, there's a minus eight, which appears in the minus counter, and then a plus nine at T3. T3 is the last writer, so everyone converges to plus nine. Now we're gonna do a multi-step modification. First step, we're gonna set X equal to two, we're gonna do some concurrent adds, then we're gonna reset X, so a new value, and we're gonna do some concurrent subtractions. And finally, we're going to show how a latecomer, the add one from step one, if that were applied to step B, it's ignored because the add one was applied to the version X equals two. It doesn't have anything to do with the reset version X equals nine. The implementation of this versioning is done by field UUIDs. Each field has a UUID, and this is how we detect race conditions. So when we set X equal to two, it has a UUID 1001, gets replicated. We add three, add one, two, three, and all of those have UUID 1001, so they all work, they're all applied, and we go on further. Now, the orange guy, he sets X equal to nine, and we get a UUID 3004, which is replicated and applied because, oh, sorry, and then we do some concurrent subtractions, which are replicated, and they're all applied because everyone has UUID 3004. Final state is plus nine minus 15 equals minus six. Now we simulate a latecomer. This is the add one. Say it, it didn't come when it was supposed to, it came a little late. It's very standard in a distributed system. So X right now has UUID 3004. This add one has UUID 1001. We don't want it applied. We detect the version, version mismatch and we ignore it. And the final state remains X equals minus. And this versioning holds the state that the commutative algorithms we're using use to autonomously resolve conflicts. The state is a substitution for consensus. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of version here, right? Field level, document level, delta level. Okay, next example we're doing in a delete. And a delete retires a UUID. It, it makes a, a tombstone, which is a database term for retiring something. And once this tombstone exists, any uh, any operations from a previous state are ignored. So we're going to delete X, and then we're going to simulate a latecomer, and then we're going to reset it to show the full life cycle. So uh, the blue guy, he deletes X. This creates a tombstone, and it sets the UUID to empty set. We replicate this, and 3004 is gone, right? It, it, it's as if it never existed. So when this late coming, subtract six comes in with 3004, it's a version mismatch, mismatch with the tombstoned empty set UUID. And then when we reset uh, X equal to one, the UUID 1003 at you know times seven wins the last writer win and everyone converges to X equals one. Okay, now let's get into some nested stuff. Let's do some objects, some dictionaries. Uh, we initialize them with set. And the, the key takeaway is that the nested fields have their own UUIDs. So initialize an empty array, replicate it. Now we're going to set a.b equals 2, which means b inside of a set equal to 2. And both a, the dictionary, and b, the element in the dictionary, have their own UUIDs. So that gets replicated. And now a subtract is going to specify both the UUID for A and the UUID for B when it replicates. And when both versions match, it's applied. Otherwise, it's ignored. And this applies to arbitrarily nesting. So this could be A.B.C.D. Keep going. All right, now let's get into an example of the second 
nested JSON data type, the array or the linked list. And the insert operation here can grow the array by inserting stuff into the middle of it or to the end of it or the beginning of it. Um, we initialize the array that's replicated and then we create a new array or element and that gets replicated and then we insert positionally at position one which is the end of the array and replicate that. So you know again the nested values have fields and when we get into the the innards of arrays uh, we actually order the array as a reverse linked list. So each element specifies their left-hand neighbor with the first element not specifying a left-hand neighbor. So the array ABC is actually C happened after B happened after A. And the reason this is done is to, is to represent linked lists and trees. So the, the picture on the right here is there's the array ABC and we have two guys concurrently adding D and E. And we have to figure out how to deal with these two guys adding D and E to C at the same time in a distributed environment. And the way we do that is we just sort their modification dates using last read or wins. And here's an example. Um, initialize with just A as the sole array element and replicate that. And now I'm going to use a different uh, representation just because it gets more complicated. So now we say B happens after A. We replicate that. We say C happens after B, we replicate that, and then concurrently, the blue guy says D happens after C, and the purple guy says E happens after C. Okay, so we replicate that. And D happened at T2, which is the last writer, so he's going to be the winner, he's going to become left. And what left means when you do a depth first traversal is it's going to be the first guy. So we do a depth first traversal on that tree we just built, and the array is A, B, C, D, E. And just to show how that keeps working, if we want to say X happens after D, we put X below D and depth first traversal is going to give A, B, C, D, X, E. And then if we want to say Y happens after E, we put Y below E. And the evaluation is A, B, C, D, X, E, Y, which makes a lot of sense. Okay, finally we're into causal plus consistency. And causality means things happen in a logical chain. Uh, for instance, you can be born, live, and die, but you can't die, born, and live. And this is the consistency guarantee that CRDT is providing in the distributed environment. And it's fairly complicated, but I'm going to make it simple with a GI Joe example. We're going to have four Joes chatting with one another, and these are the original 12-inch Joes. And the messages that they say, they're going to have a causal order, and we're going to mess the causal order up, and it's going to make the Joes look kind of bad. So a fun fact about the G.I. Joe is that the maker of Barbie thought, I'll just militarize these and market them to boys and it'll be a big hit. And he was, he was right. So these Joes are going to insert their messages into an array. And Beachhead kicks it off by asking the Joes if they're ready. That gets replicated. Duke goes, yo. And that gets replicated. And Army Heavy Gunner, because the 12-inch guys didn't even have names yet, he says, you know, you guys scared? That gets replicated, and then Navy Special Ops says, hell no. Uh, that gets replicated, and everyone, you know, is on the same page. We got a, a good Joe conversation that says, ready, yo, scared, hell no. And what I showed there was perfect replication, no race conditions. Um, but there's no guarantee in a distributed environment that things happen that way. So we're going to change the order of replication, still an acceptable order of replication, um, and we're going to show that if causality is not respected, then the Joes look like some sissies. So Beachhead asks Ready. That gets replicated to everybody. Duke goes Yo. It gets replicated to two guys, but it's on its way to Beachhead. And Army Heavy Gunner says Scared, which makes it to the Navy Special Ops guy, who then says Hell No. So this is the state right now. There are several modifications that are still in flight, but this is the picture of what has been processed by the actors. And now it goes all wrong. Due to race conditions, hell no gets the beachhead first, and then scared, and then yo. And what just happened was beachhead thinks that the team isn't ready and that Duke is scared. And this all happened because we didn't respect causality property. So how do you respect causality? What you do is you put a vector clock in each delta. A vector clock essentially encodes the dependencies of the delta. And 
if the causal chain is not complete, when a recipient actor gets the delta, he cues it until the chain is complete. So an example of that is when Beachhead gets this hell no, he's like, wait, there's two messages that are missing. And then he gets a scared and he goes, okay, but there's still one message missing. And then he gets the yo, and it's okay, the causal chain has been complete, and he replays it in causal order to get the proper Joe conversation. Ready, yo, scared, hell no. Okay, so let's do a little summarization. We covered uh, four operations, set, delete, increment, and insert. And we showed how they cover all of JSON's data types and that CRDTs can cover all of JSON's data types. We went into some race conditions. Uh, we did a lot of versioning. We showed how commutative algorithms work. And finally, we got into causal plus consistency, and we talked about delta vector clocks. And the whole idea was just to show the fundamentals of how CRDTs work in practice. Now, there's a lot more to CRDT systems. They're a lot bigger, a lot more complicated. They have some very unique and special attributes. Um, but they take, you know, another 15 minutes to talk about. So... Thanks for your attention, and I hope you guys have a better understanding of how CRDTs function and work now.